Metallica vs. Megadeth. Within metal and hard rock, there are very few other combinations of words with VS in between that are so ubiquitous. It's the Xbox versus PlayStation of metal. The only thing that even comes close is maybe Ozzy versus Dio. I'm surprised there isn't an episode of Epic Rap Battles of History yet. Anywhere you look where either band is mentioned, there's a good chance you'll find some passionate fan giving their unsolicited opinion of which thrash band rules them all, not counting all the other thrash bands. In fact, I'm convinced that 9 out of 10 people clicking on this video already have their own steadfast opinion on the matter, from those who worship the ground that James Hetfield walks on to those whom suck on the teats of Daddy Dave Mustaine. But when did it start? And when will it stop? To answer these questions out of order, one, when hell freezes over, and two, in the very early 80s. In 1981, two teenagers putting together a heavy metal band put out an ad in the newspaper looking for a lead guitarist who was influenced by bands like Motorhead and Iron Maiden. Those two teenagers were drummer Lars Ulrich and rhythm guitarist slash vocalist James Hetfield. The band they were forming was called Metallica, and the man who answered their ad was a 20-year-old Dave Mustaine. And after maybe the shortest audition of all time, he was hired after James, Lars, and original bassist Ron McGovney only heard him warm up. They said, you got the job, and I went, that was easy. From that moment, the original lineup of Metallica found the final piece of the puzzle. But there's a reason why there's two pretty huge lineup changes prior to the recording of their very first record. Ron McGovney was the first to go after only recording a few demos. After a physical altercation between Ron, James, and Dave that led to Mustaine's dismissal for a grand total of one day. The bass player goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And then James goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And I said, you win, James. And I belted him in the mouth. Knocked him across the room. I mean, just, I mean, he wasn't even expecting it. And the bass player jumped me and I flipped him. He threw me against the wall like a big judo throw. And we just got him to, get out of here, you're out of the band, you know? All right, F you, blah, blah, blah. And he goes in, packs up all his stuff, leaves, comes back the next day. Can I be back in the band? You go, all right, okay, you're back in the band. And Dave pouring a beer into the pickups of his bass, destroying it. You may have heard an exaggerated version of this story in the behind the music on Megadeth. Go plug it in. That blew me across the room. Shocked the hell out of me. But anyone who's ever worked with electronics would know that guitar pickups don't really work that way. It said that you once poured a full can of beer down Ron, Ron McGovney's bass, which gave him an electric shock that blew him across the room. That's a lie. No, I didn't do it to hurt him. And anybody with half a brain cell knows that if you pour liquid into a, an object that you know is not plugged in at the moment and it wasn't because why would ron be wearing a, a, a guitar and let me pour a beer into it as soon as you do that it stops working safe to say he wasn't to last james hetfield said around that time ron didn't contribute anything he just followed he left and was replaced by Cliff Burton. At this time, they're really starting to get some buzz within the emerging Bay Area thrash scene, but it was becoming more and more apparent that Dave was becoming a liability. They all partook in their fair share of drinking, but Dave not only was addicted to a copious amount of drugs, but even when he just drank, unlike the other members of the band, he would get mean and violent. James, Lars, and Cliff would get silly, and Dave would try attacking someone with the five-point palm exploding heart technique. Brian Slagle, owner of Metal Blade Records, the man who released a compilation that included the first ever recording of Metallica, said years later, Dave was an incredibly talented guy, but he also had an incredibly large problem with alcohol and drugs. He would get wasted and become a real crazy person, a raging megalomaniac, and the other guys just couldn't deal with that after a while. I mean, they all drank, of course, but Dave drank more. Much more. I could see they were beginning to get fed up of seeing Dave drunk out of his mind all the time. But things got really bad on the band's trip from California to New York in a U-Haul truck to record their debut album. In Wyoming, Dave was driving and he hit a patch of black ice and crashed. Dave believes this pretty much sealed the deal in him eventually being kicked out of the band. But I believe that's pure conjecture. I don't think there was any way Dave was staying in that band. And on a cold New York morning on the 11th of April, Dave Mustaine, as he has famously said in several documentaries, with No warning, no second chance, he was fired from the band. And now that I think about it, since Dave was already fired once before, I guess he did get both a warning and a second chance. So with a bus ticket and a shove, 
Dave Mustaine was gone. They could have at least sprung a ticket for a plane like they did for Kirk because he was on his way to New York to audition, so he wouldn't have to spend four grueling days on a bus from one side of the country to the other. And in a case like this, you really can't blame Dave for being as angry as he was. Put away any preconceived notions you might have about Mustaine as a person, and despite the hat I'm wearing in my profile picture, trust me, I have a few as well. I'm no fanboy. But imagine you thought you found your home in a band, you gave your fair share of blood, sweat, and tears to the band's cause, and after a brutal U-Haul trip from California to New York to record your debut album, you're woken up one morning out of the blue and was told to pack up your belongings and go home, without even an opportunity to redeem yourself in their eyes. They knew for at least 10 days that they were going to kick Dave out of the band, so it wasn't a spur of the moment decision. They never sat him down and said, hey Dave, you need to cut down on the drinking or, hey Dave, maybe take some anger management courses. And to add insult to injury, your replacement was flying in later that day to record your parts, your material, on their album. And the band that you were unceremoniously kicked out from became the biggest band on earth. I'm honestly surprised Dave never went postal. I can't think of many other people within metal besides those who have died or sustained serious injury who have gone through as much as him. But Dave didn't take it lying down. He was built different. A lesser musician might just quit after something like that, but Dave went on to form one of the best-selling and most beloved metal bands of all time out of spite. And from the very beginning, people were pitting Megadeth against Dave's former band, mainly Dave himself. There's a somewhat unhinged interview Dave did in 1985 with Metal Forces after Megadeth's first album, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good came out, and I don't think I've ever seen a more bitter interview in my life. At first I thought it was going to be okay because the interviewer immediately asked him about getting cans from Metallica, and he replied by saying, It was more or less an attitude problem, not ability. We've tried to patch things up, but there's still certain vibes there. It's not something I really want to go into as I still like the guys and I don't want to hurt their success by putting them down or try and make myself look better. Basically, when they told me to leave, I packed in about 20 seconds and I was gone. Pretty mature and level-headed, I must say. Anyway, he immediately followed it up with this. Upsets? Oh no. I wasn't upset at all as I wanted to start a solo project during the middle of Metallica anyway. In the past, we tried to kick both Lars and James out of the band. Lars started to cry because he didn't want to leave and we gave James a second chance because he wasn't singing too well at the time. And when asked about including the song Mechanics on the album, a primordial version of the song that would become the Four Horsemen on Kill Em All, Dave went on this little tirade. That was just to straighten Metallica up. They're saying I'm a drunk and I can't play. It's real funny how Kirk Hammett ripped off every lead break I had played on that No Life to Leather tape and got voted number one guitarist in your magazine. It's also funny how they play their second album and they still got a reel to reel of all my riffs and stuff. God knows when they're gonna stop writing the songs that I originally wrote. I think when Metallica have got all their gold and platinum records, they should have the decency to say, here, send one to Dave too, cause he wrote all the shit and Kirk played every one of his solos. On Ride the Lightning, Dave Marsh, who used to be Lars's drum roadie, told me that they had Kirk going over old practice tapes and Cliff was even writing lead solos. How can people vote this guy number one guitar player when he's ripped me off? If anyone should have been voted number one, it should have been me. Not that I'm jealous. I mean, I'm glad they're doing well as I'm getting paid for it. Well, one of these days. Dave, I'm not sure if you could sound any more jealous if you tried. Even disregarding Metallica, Dave is full of stories that make you look at him funny. The subject of then current guitarist Dave Alberts came up, the guy who played on the Killing Is My Business tour before Chris Poland came back for Peace Cells. In this interview, Dave claims that he was the guy who convinced Eddie Van Halen to switch from a Les Paul to a Strat with a whammy bar, which by many accounts is not true in the slightest. Maybe Albert fed him some bullshit information, but judging by this interview, I imagine this is all Dave. Even the interviewer, who praised Dave for being a down-to-earth guy, called these statements unfounded in the epilogue. Dave has also claimed that before Cliff died, they were planning on getting rid of Lars. Lars doesn't, uh, he won't ever cop to this, but he was getting canned when uh, the, the guys were coming back from the European tour before Cliff died. They planned on getting rid of him. Now, for a guy who wasn't even on speaking terms with the band at the time, it makes you wonder how he would even know such a personal detail that wasn't already common knowledge. And these comments continue to this very day, with Dave calling himself the alpha male of the early incarnation of Metallica. Yeah, so alpha you got kicked out of the band, Dave. And then there's this interview with Guitar World from only a few months ago, 
February of this year. The interview started with Dave bemoaning, Metallica got a big head start and they did so on the back of what I helped create. They became one of the biggest bands in the world and here's one of the biggest bands wasting their breath trying to discredit me by saying Dave's not a good guitar player. Excuse me? What the fuck did you say? I wrote many of the songs that made you famous, so you should probably recheck that bullshit statement. And during research for this video, I have watched and read a good amount of Metallica and Megadeth interviews. And for how many Metallica interviews I have consumed, you would think I would see a lot of the Metallica guys shit talking Dave. Especially since Dave prefaces every mudslinging by talking about how they lie about him all the time, calling him a bad player, diminishing his influence. But I've seen nothing of the sort during my research, or during the 15 years or so of my being a fan of Metallica. And with my autistic brain, I am a magnet for information regarding bands I like. Trust me, if I ever heard or saw something like that, I would definitely remember. One of the most damning statements I've seen Metallica say about Dave slash Megadeth, and I say damning in the biggest quotation marks, is during an interview they did in 1985 for the day on the green. Lars said that Kirk was more involved with writing than Dave was. I think the only thing that changed a bit was that when Kirk and Cliff joined the band, they uh, contributed it to the songwriting end of things, which the two other members didn't in the early days. Which I have a hard time believing, but based on co-writing credits, they're probably on a similar level in terms of contributions. And when asked about what makes Metallica special compared to bands like Slayer and Megadeth, Lars says this. A lot of these bands um, catch on to a lot of the cliches that are going on in heavy metal today. We try and, and shy away from as many of them as we can. Now that's a bit unfair, sure, but keep in mind Slayer just released Hell Awaits and Megadeth just released Killing Is My Business, which has plenty of metal cliches. But then again, so did Kill Em All, so swings and roundabouts. There's also a clip of James Hetfield kind of throwing some shade at Dave after his cameo in Some Kind of Monster. I had no idea what the hell AA was back then, and, and it was disturbing to hear Dave say that, you know, he's still stuck in some kind of non-reality. I mean, we didn't know what it was back then. Are you kidding? If we would have, you know, if we would have known, he would have known. So we wouldn't have had to tell him. Which is fair. It's not the rest of the band's responsibility to get a member who is that self-destructive clean. Maybe it's a bit unempathetic, sure, but given how long it took Dave to get sober, I can understand why the band didn't want to deal with it. They wanted to take over the world, and they didn't want to coddle one of their members who was such a liability. There's also an interview from 1986 when someone asked them why there were no pictures of Dave on any of their albums because he helped write some of the songs. Because he's not in the band. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, Dave. Hang up. Hey, Dave, we, 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 what no, we no, told you about calling up the radio station? <laughs> finish your question, man. I know that, but uh, when I know that some of the songs were written by him. And well, you know, it, partially by you, him. You gotta credit people where credit is due, but if someone's not in your band, you generally don't put their picture on your you album. You should put a little picture. <laughs> <laughs> he only wrote a little song. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I see this as less making fun of Dave and more making fun of the caller's question. It's a bit ridiculous to put a picture of a guy who isn't even in the band anymore on the album. At worst, these comments are just inaccurate or a bit unfair. But every other time I've seen Metallica get asked about Dave, even back then and in the prior interview, They've always been incredibly respectful. The first record didn't do that much for me. I mean, I respected it and stuff like that, but I was like a really big fan of Peace Sells. The second record I thought was an awesome heavy metal record at that time. Um, and I listened to it a lot. And even though I certainly didn't tell anybody at the time, I was actually, I guess, secretly kind of proud of the work that he'd done because he had stepped up to the plate. I certainly didn't tell James. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now I know. <laughs> It's especially jarring going from Metallica and Megadeth interviews because I've heard Dave pay very little respect to Metallica. And even the few times he does, he undercuts it. I think we forgave each other rather quickly. I've seen him a lot and, and run into each other a lot in the last couple of years. Me and him have actually gotten a kind of a cool phone thing. He calls me once in a while and just tells me how he's doing. I have a really a kind of a, a pure thing going and stuff like that. I like James. You know, Lars, I can take or leave. I mean, I think that the whole world kind of looks at it like that too. You know, the one thing you got to admire about anybody who's been around for as long as he has, you know, just the staying power is awesome. I mean, in, in a time frame where most bands stick around for 15 minutes or less, it, it's just awesome that it's been 15, 16 years for him and he's still here making records. And so 
You gotta always tip your hat to that. He's not a good drummer. He really isn't. Any good drummer will tell you that he's not. And and th their success, you know what? A lot of it is based off of me. Dave was kind of bitter. I mean, it wasn't like the sweetest of breakups. And, um, you know, but he has a great band and he's uh, made some records that I really like. You guys said it's like the difference between Megadeth and Metallica was the difference between the Clash and the Ramones. It's because we're a thinking band and they're a thrashing band. You know, and it's not that hard to, to sit there and go wheelie really do on the leads, you know, instead of trying to do pentatonic inverted we scales. Really do. And the Kirk thing is something we should discuss. Dave has quite the fascination with shitting on Kirk every opportunity he has. Even in Megadeth's behind the music, when Dave is trying to be nice, he still has to throw a dig at Kirk. You know, I'm over it now, and I can I can see how hard he tries to do what he does. I mean, I think he, he makes really good use of what talent he has. Even in that Guitar World interview I just discussed, if we look at the things I played, I guess Kirk Hammett did a noble job of trying. He took a swing, but I asked my guitar players for a bit more than taking a swing. Were they doing a previous guitar player solo? I asked them to do it right and pay tribute. That's how you honor it. When you go into an established song and don't do the solo right, that's a problem. On one hand, I can understand some of the aggression. He did take Dave's spots, but if it wasn't Kirk, it would have been somebody else. Kirk is pretty innocent here. Again, let's compare how Dave and Kirk speak about each other. It was really unusual because, like, uh, I was standing there, and you know, I'm I'm always you know, polite about it. I go, "Hey, Dave, how you doing?" And he goes, "Hey, how you doing?" And uh, he he said, uh, he, just, "He basically just came up to me and, and apologized yeah. for all the bad mouthing that he that he did to to me and 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 the band." And uh, you know, I was really surprised, and um, I think that that was a. That was a, a result of you know him cleaning up and actually being able to think with a clear head. Cool. And, you know, Must have felt good to have that resolved a bit. Yeah, you know, I thought it was you know, very decent of him. The first time that I heard how long that they allowed Kirk to do his solo, I thought, God, he's horrible. Don't really like Kirk because he got my job, but yeah, right. you know, I nailed his girlfriend before I left. So. Whoa. But with that being said, I was able to find one clip of Kirk actually taking a dig at Dave. Dave Mustaine hadn't been kicked out of Metallica. Do you think you would have formed Megadeth? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been it? Yeah, the, I would be playing with Megadeth and, you know. Well, you know, with better vocals, though. Better vocals? Because, like, you know, I can sing better than that guy. Can you sing a little bit like Dave Mustaine? Uh, do you, do you I would, would, not, would not put that on any person. But as much of a burn this is, it's obvious to tell that it's a joke. Whereas I'm sure that Dave has never told a joke in his life since 1983. And even if it wasn't a joke and Kirk was 100% serious, I'm okay with letting him have this one. With the amount of shit Kirk has taken from Dave and Dave's drooly fanboys over the years for his playing, I think he's earned the right to take a shot right back at them. And hey, maybe James and Lars really did call Dave everything but a child of God at some points. Maybe it's a huge coincidence that there's literally no sources of them saying this other than Dave himself. And I think I've made it quite clear why Dave is not the most reliable guy ever, to put it lightly. And even if it's true, and at one point Lars and James did say that Dave is a bad player, with all the shit he has since thrown back at them, I can't get too mad on Dave's behalf. He says Metallica lies about him, but whenever Dave's dismissal is brought up, the band respectfully say it was because of self-destructive and violent drinking, something Dave has said himself. I had been physically reckless, and there had been a lot of pushing and shoving on my part with everyone in the band. I was very unpredictable, and I embarrassed everyone around me. I still look back on those times as mostly fun, but usually the time when I would start to get to the point where violence would occur was when I was heading towards a blackout. That continued long after I left Metallica. And it was the main reason why, in 1988, I decided I'm gonna stop. It just took a long fucking time to get the train slowed down. So he seemingly admits to everything Metallica has ever reliably said about him. Dave. Everything else he claims the band has said is baseless with zero proof. He cites himself as a source, but he was probably blackout wasted for a vast majority of the 80s. Given all his fabrications I've already discussed, I can't say I trust him as a singular source with no one else backing him up. And even after everything Davis said, he still wonders why Metallica won't share a stage with him anymore. In that Guitar World interview I said it before, he said, The fact is simple. The world wants to see Megadeth Metallica play together. Does Megadeth need Metallica? No. But Metallica talks about their fans, but they don't give them what they've been asking for. What are they afraid of? I don't know. It's not me, it's them. There's a reason the big four is playing right now. <laughs>
Gee, Dave, I wonder why they wouldn't want to play with someone who's been slagging them off nonstop for decades. Even after the several reconciliation attempts like the Big Four shows, which I imagine were mostly thanks to Metallica anyway. Also somewhat off topic, if you've ever wondered why the No Life to Leather demo still has yet to see a legitimate release, despite Metallica saying they want to put it out, well, I'll let you figure that one out on your own. And do Megadeth need Metallica? Not really. But Metallica definitely don't need Megadeth. They can sell at any size room on Earth. Even the hugely successful Big Four string of dates, I'm sure there wouldn't be much difference in terms of attendance for those shows if it was only Metallica. Sure, there wouldn't be anywhere near as much fanfare, but they could have easily just done those shows as just Metallica, and there still likely wouldn't be an empty seat in the house. And to add the cherry on top of this insane Guitar World interview, he says, and I quote, in my mind, there's no competition between Megadeth and Metallica. Only for the very next line to be, we're different bands, and I believe Megadeth has been more consistent. Dave, you can't be this delusional, dude. It's so ridiculous that this famous war of words between Megadeth and Metallica is so one-sided. For fans, a big part of what makes the Metallica v Megadeth feud going is that Metallica sold out after the 80s, man. Megadeth is always about musical integrity. Well, I feel the most uh, important and valuable thing that, that I have as far as an, uh, an asset would be uh, integrity and not ever having to compromise my musical uh, approach towards doing what I feel is right. I'm in this business for the reason that Megadeth is in this business, and that's because of attitude, integrity, and music. Yeah, I want to stay at a street level because then I don't have any, you know, pretentious values in life, and I don't start writing music just for the dollar sign. Now, to those who propagate this very skewed perspective, may I ask you something? Have you guys ever actually listened to any Megadeth post-1990? Megadeth are just as guilty, if not more so than Metallica, of changing their sound for dubious purposes. Is Risk not one of the most controversial records ever released by a metal band? Sure, it's not quite St. Anger levels of infamous, and I don't think it's as bad, but everyone calls out this record for what it is, a sellout. David said several times that this was him trying to get on the radio and attain that forever elusive number one album that Billy Ray Cyrus cucked him on in 1992. We knew it was going to be uh, one of those records that is going to be hit or miss in a very big way. It's either going to be enormous or it's going to be a terrible failure. That's why we called it Risk. We also have Cryptic Writings, which again is clearly Dave pining for radio play, though not as egregious with albeit a few heavy tracks. Just listen to the singles. As much as I love Trust in a Secret Place, I can call a spade a spade. Even Countdown to Extinction and Euthanasia was Megadeth kind of falling Metallica and making less thrashy and more commercial metal records. Whether you like Megadeth's output during this time is irrelevant, I do too for the record. But if Metallica sold out, then you bet your bottom dollar that Megadeth did too. Speaking of which, I have a hard time believing Metallica sold out like a lot of people say. Mad Mike made a great video as to why the Black Album isn't really a sellout. I highly recommend it. It's a really good watch and I'll link it in the description so you can watch it yourself and I don't have to repeat his points. And Load and Reload are just Metallica trying and failing to experiment and expand their sound, which didn't really work because Metallica just aren't great musicians at the end of the day, so them experimenting and being self-indulgent just sounds obnoxious. As for Saint Anger, that was just a therapy session disguised as an album. It's not really new metal, so I don't know what the fuck Wikipedia's smoking. And if anyone is to sell it in this instance, it's Megadeth. Ever since 1992, they have been chasing Metallica's ghost. Just look at their trajectory compared to Dave's former band. He even named Risk after Lars said that Dave needs to take more risks. Though I should stress, calling something a sellout at the end of the day is just reductive. It's nothing but speculation, except cases like Risk where Dave has just straight up admitted it. But even then, you should address art on its own merits. It's easy just to write something off and call it a sellout, but you should instead actually engage with art in a meaningful way. 
and I don't know actually listen to the records you talk about? Who knows, you might actually like it, it's not impossible. But I know you clicked on this video for a verdict, not just a history. So I'll try my best to give you one. But of course, keep in mind that there's no such thing as an objective comparison for a pair of bands like this. I mean, the most objective thing is sales, and uh, Metallica win that one by a wide margin. So all I can offer you is an opinion. An opinion that I should clarify has changed a couple of times. So if you asked me which thrash band I preferred at different parts of my life, you'd get different answers for different reasons. I can't stress enough that I love both bands, and this will be very hard for me, but I'll try my best. I think the first course of action is to determine who's the better guitar player, Dave Mustaine or Kirk Hammett. Dave made a huge stink about how Kirk basically ripped off his solos note for note, or didn't play them well enough and merely took a swing at them. And after listening to Dave's solos on the No Life to Leather demo and Kirk's solos on Kill Em All, Kirk is playing by and large the same solos. They have the same starts and end points, but he takes some different avenues to get there. As for what I prefer, I don't know if I can answer that. The Kirk versions of the solos are the ones I've heard millions of times, so they're ingrained into my brain. Whereas I can count the amount of times I've gone out of my way to listen to the No Life to Leather demo tape on one hand. But comparing both guitarists on their own merits, yeah, I like Dave Mustaine more. But it's not that simple. I'll, I'll explain it in a little bit. I feel Dave is far more consistent in his solos, whereas Kirk's modern solos are the definition of lazy. I mean, compare a solo from the last Metallica and Megadeth records, and they do all the talking. I also like Dave's riffs more than Kirk's. Dave grew up listening to a lot of R&B, and you can tell with the weird-ass tempos he uses for his riffs, which you never really hear much in the context of metal, especially in Megadeth's early days. He's far more creative in that regard. His rhythm playing is more complex than many of the greatest guitarists' leads. He's a freak of nature. <laughs> But in the classic eras of both bands, I would say I prefer Kirk's solos. Even taking into account Kill em All's solos are mostly Dave's. It's hard to believe now, but once upon a time, Kirk was great at elevating Metallica songs with his solos. One, Welcome Home Sanitarium, Disposable Heroes, The Unforgiven, Fight Fire with Fire, I can go on. And I've said this on more than one occasion, but Fates of Black is one of the all-time great guitar solos. Top 10 easily, if not higher. And it's my favorite guitar solo ever. It's dripping with emotion, soul, and heartbreak. It sounds like the guitar itself is crying. It's a great example of how you can use the guitar to express yourself. This solo is almost its own song, and it has its own crescendo and everything. Sure, there's more complex solos out there, but music is about expression, not complexity. I don't care that even back then he was a pentatonic madman. It fit the songs, and that's all that matters. Like Slayer's solos are objectively terrible. But they fit Slayer. It's all about playing to the song at the end of the day. And Dave's solos are great too. They have that same frantic energy that his riffs have, and again, they fit Megadeth to a T. Dave's solos are the stuff of legend as well, but I'd be lying if I said he wasn't often overshadowed in that regard by other guitar players he's had in Megadeth, like Marty Friedman or Chris Poland. They have their own strengths and weaknesses, and while I prefer Dave as a guitarist, make no mistake, Kirk is best suited for Metallica. 
Or at least he was best suited in Metallica. What the fuck happened there? Meanwhile, Dave worked better in his own band. With how big that guy's head is, I can't imagine him working in Metallica longer than he did. As for vocals, it's pretty much a running joke that Dave Mustaine is not a good singer, even within Megadeth's fanbase. And James Hetfield, in terms of being able to carry a tune, schools him three ways to Sunday. But like I said before, they both fit their respective bands. But I'll be lying if I said that Dave Mustaine's voice didn't get ear grating after a while. But James Hetfield adopted that annoying ass croon in the 90s, so he's not innocent either. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but I noticed while editing that I was maybe a bit harsh here, or at least harsher than I intended. I love both Dave's and James's vocals, and I like Hook and Mouth for the record. I was just trying to say that vocally they both have weaknesses, but at the end of the day, it fits the music so I can't bitch too much. But the albums, the albums, the albums. Who do I think made the best albums? Why I know who made the most albums. Yeah, funnily enough, despite forming two years later and the fact that they were broken up for a couple years in the early 2000s, Megadeth have 16 studio albums compared to Metallica's 11. Megadeth were one of the most consistent thrash bands for a while in terms of releasing new material. Every two or three years, they would have a new record. That is, however, until their 2016 album Dystopia, because after that it took them six years to release their last album, The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead. Meanwhile, Metallica really make you wait for the new albums. It's kind of funny how Rob Trujillo is by far their longest serving bass player, being in the band for almost 20 years now, and he somehow only played on three studio albums. But Metallica's also done weird stuff, like the two SM albums and the 598 EP and Garage Inc. album that are chock full of covers. I am the butterfly. So, I guess that's something to consider. So, as well as comparing album by album, I'll also compare them by eras. And trust me, there's a lot of parallels. First up, the classic thrash period. The first four albums by each band. They both have their debuts that are incredibly rough around the edges in terms of production, but they both have songs that more than make up for it. Some people don't like these albums, but in my mind and the minds of many others, they're quintessential thrash. They both have an album that is a bit of an ugly duckling, the production is lacking especially in the bottom ends, but not in a lo-fi way like their debuts, it just sounds like there was a major issue with the mixing. Not all the songs are amazing, but there's still a lot of classic stuff, with a ballad serving as one of the big highlights on each record. And each band have two bona fide masterpieces each. A lot of bands are lucky to even have one album approaching the level of these records, but Metallica and Megadeth somehow caught lightning in a bottle twice. You can pick any of these records as their best, and I can't even argue. The sounds on these albums are impeccable, and you'd be hard pressed to find a dud. I know some people don't like songs like Escape or I Ain't Superstitious, but they both serve a purpose on their respective albums. As for what I personally like best after listening to these albums, I would say I prefer Kill em All to Killing Is My Business. The production has a better defined bottom ends and a richer sound quality. The songs are catchier and you can tell Metallica had a knack for writing anthems from the very beginning. It's just a more well-rounded album. Every riff is iconic, it's the sound of a war being waged against the glam bands of the time. A war Metallica would end up winning. But at the same time, Killing Is My Business is nothing to sneeze at. Dave wants us to play faster and heavier than Metallica, and he did. It's a blistering half an hour of thrash. You'd be hard pressed to find many other albums outside the first wave of black metal to be this visceral, but nothing is ever lost in translation. Megadeth in a lot of ways were much better musicians than their contemporaries. Drummer Garth Samuelson and lead guitarist Chris Poland were both jazz musicians, so as much as of a cacophonic barrage this record is, it's still controlled chaos. So I can totally see why someone might like it better than Kill 'em All. It's not a better or worse thing. It just comes down to what you prefer, and I prefer Kill 'em All. Oh, and as for Mechanics vs. Four Horsemen, probably doesn't surprise you, but yeah, I prefer the Four Horsemen. I think the lyrics are better, and I like the slow Sweet Home Alabama section and the solo that Kirk added. Though it's slower and nowhere near as cutthroat as mechanics. Which is something Dave will never let you forget. 
Okay, that's their way. This is our way. And just as for Raw versus So Far So Good So What is tough for many of the same reasons. But again, I'll go with Metallica because I prefer the running motif or theme of this album being justice, war, the environment, and politics. Yes, this album is deeply political. Songs like Blackened, Eye of the Beholder, and the title track speak for themselves. Just because James isn't screaming about Reagan or Bush like an anarcho punk band, it doesn't mean it isn't political. In fact, James shying away from naming anyone in particular is what makes the lyrics so poignant as it isn't dated in the slightest. Also, this record showed Metallica pushing themselves to be even more technical in their approach to songwriting, which is why there's a bunch of funky time signatures on this record and a bunch of really cool weird solos and riffs. My biggest complaint is the fact that some songs definitely go on too long. Some tracks feel kind of samey and of course there's no bass at all. Some say for these reasons alone, so far so good so what is the better record, but let's not forget that that album isn't exactly the best produced Megadeth record either. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a good record too. In fact, I think it's kind of underrated because people shit on this album a lot. But it's kind of just another Megadeth album. There's some amazing songs, but so far so good doesn't give you much reason to listen to it over other Megadeth LPs. Production wise, it's thin, tinny, and compressed, but compared to Injustice, it may as well be Pet Sounds. Their cover of Anarchy in the UK leaves a lot to be desired, and until the mid 90s, this is definitely the lamest thing they ever put to tape. Sure, it's better than Motley Crue's version, but that's not saying much. Also, on the song Hook and Mouth, attacking the PMRC in 1988 was a bit late to the party as good as that song is. There's also classic tracks like Mary Jane, Liar, Set the World Afire, and In My Darkest Hour, which is my favorite Megadeth song in case you care to know. So again, it's close, but Metallica takes this one. And Ride the Lightning, Master Puppets, versus Peace Cells, and Rust in Peace. Damn, this one hurts. These are all albums I'll happily take to my grave. But I think I have to go with Megadeth. I can put either Peace Cells or Rust in Peace on at any time, have a blast, and never even think about looking at my watch. Whereas I think I'm ever so slightly burnt out on a couple of songs from Master and Ride the Lightning. I've just heard them so many times. But I stress, this is ridiculously close. These are both perfectly performed and produced albums. Ride and Master have this great apocalyptic atmosphere. Meanwhile, Peace Cells and Rust in Peace also have great atmospheres and nudge out Metallica in terms of musicianship, in my opinion. Say what you want about Dave, but he knows how to pick a good band to support him. Rust in particular is just a massively crafted record. It's not controlled chaos like some previous Megadeth records, but it's laser precise and an absolute audio assault. <laughs> But the same can be said for Master of Puppets. The whole album is a journey that goes in so many different directions. You can listen to it a million times and always find something new. Lest we forget, Peace Cells and Ride the Lightning are also magnificent for many of the same reasons Rust in Peace and Master of Puppets are. Like I said, this is ridiculously close. I've written a racist paragraph twice now because I've had such a hard time deciding. So in my heart, it's more like a draw. But for the sake of the video, I'll choose Megadeth. As for the errors of both bands when they start changing and adapting their sound, again, we have four records each. For Metallica, we have from the Black Album to St. Anger, and for Megadeth, we have from Countdown to Extinction to Risk. And yeah, I don't need to think very hard about this one, Megadeth easily clears. The only true comparison that makes me think for even a second is Countdown versus the Black Album. Both are great, and I've had to somewhat make up with the Black Album over the past few years after growing a distaste for it during my edgy thrasher phase of my teenage years, but it's a great metal record. It's not the best Metallica album of all time, sure, but I can't think of any album that's gotten more people into heavier music than this one, because it's amazingly produced so Enormi's baby ears that would explode trying to listen to a band like Venom can listen to it. It's commercial, but not to a fault. It's in a great Goldilocks position. Besides, nothing else matters, I never liked that song. But the other radio songs are great, if a little played out. And the deep cuts like Holier Than Thou, A Wolf and Man, My Friend of Misery, and The God That Failed help make this album such a vital piece of not just metal history, but music history. But Countdown to Extinction, in my opinion, keeps making that spirit more alive in the commercial context. 
Dave's voice has gotten better, but he's still Dave. It's not like the Black Album because James's voice was never the same after recording that album. It's still quite edgy with songs like Captive Honor, Skin of My Teeth, and Sweating Bullets, but there's also songs that, dare I say it, feel downright mature with tracks about social inequality like Foreclosure of a Dream and the title track attacking trophy hunters and the states of the environments and where it was going. It has unfortunately aged quite well, I must say. And Ashes in Your Mouth is about the grisly aftermath of all wars. It also is produced magnificently, but what else do you expect from Max Norman? As for Load and Reload, yeah, these albums suck. Just boring, generic sounding alternative rock. Sure, there's some brief moments of southern rock, country, and dare I say it's even a little bit of metal here or there. But there's so few and far between it doesn't even matter. And I'll admit that there's some good stuff here. I like Until It Sleeps, King Nothing, Devil's Dance, Unforgiven 2, and Where the Wild Things Are. So out of 27 tracks on both albums, I like 5 of them. You don't need to be a math whiz to know that isn't a great batting average. Sure, not every other song is outright bad, but a lot of them are. And the mid songs piss me off even more because many of them could have been really good too. It feels like Bob Rock was really slacking off during this time. The reason why he was so good on the Black Album is because he whipped them into shape. Especially Kirk, he gave him so much shit for the solo on The Unforgiven until he finally nailed it. Is there any way we can pick it up? Just like a touch. After many years of experience working with some of the finest guitars ever to bless fucking music, one of the first things that happen when a guitar player hasn't done his homework is he goes, the sound ain't, ain't working for me, man. I just can't get into this. Sound. Remember what I said about guitar players that don't do their homework? Yeah. Remember, just remember that. Hey, man, do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> I do, man. In the Todd in the Shadows train records video about St. Anger, he said that by then, Bob Rock was their friend less than he was a producer. And I think that kind of started here. Now, the album still sounds pretty good. He didn't drop the ball in that aspect. But a lot of these songs and performances are first drafted best. He should have put his foot down and said, You guys are Metallica. Why does it feel like I'm in the studio with a wannabe Alice in Chains? On the channel, we're currently doing a series on Load and Reload for James and Friends. Part 1 came out a little while ago, and Part 2 should be out soon enough, if not already by the time this video is released. And it's been a fun time, I'll say that much. It ain't my bitch! <laughs> Meanwhile, Euthanasia and Cryptic Writings are pretty good albums and quite underrated in my opinion. Granted, they're not as good as some of the prior Megadeth albums, but for a quote unquote sellout, these albums could be much worse. Granted, Euthanasia is more like Countdown Part 2, so we're kind of starting to get to the point where album by album comparison doesn't really work. So please forgive me here, I'm doing my best. It's also produced, or co produced, I should say, by Max Norman, so it still sounds great, especially Nick Menz's drums. Rest in peace, you fucking legend. I'm honestly really surprised coming back to this because besides a few tracks, this album never really grabs me much back in the day, so I never listened to it a whole lot. So I'd pretty much always much rather listen to Countdown to Extinction. But Euthanasia is nothing to sleep on. It's maybe a little lighter in the loafers with tracks like A Toot Le Monde or I Thought I Knew It All, but even those tracks are really good. Lest we forget Reckoning Day, Train of Consequences, Addicted to Chaos, Blood of Heroes, Black Curtains, so many good tracks. I highly recommend this album if you haven't listened to it already. Cryptic Writings is a downgrade from Euthanasia, definitely, but I like this album too. This is the first album with Dan Huff, and they're chasing radio with the singles, but besides some songs, it's not too different from the two albums that preceded it. And even the singles are good commercial rock songs. Trust is stupid catchy, and so is The Secret Place. Though Almost Honest is a huge turd, and being the second track on this record does this album no favors at all. Seriously, this song is up there with the worst of 90s Metallica. That chorus is painful. I feel like I'm listening to fucking Silverchair. But besides that and the pretty dumb mastermind, this album is a decent to good alternative rock slash metal record. It gets kind of weird with tracks like Have Cool Will Travel, Sin, and I'll Get Even. They even get thrashy on the Disintegrators and Fight for Freedom, or as it's written on the album, Fight for Freedom! Megadeth win this round by a wide margin. Fuck Load and Reload. All my homies hate Load and Reload. As for St. Anger and Risk, there are no winners here. 
Abandon hope all ye who enter. I know it's passe to shit on these records, but in my defense it was pretty lame of Metallica and Megadeth to have released these albums to begin with. They have their reputations for a very good reason. They're boring at best and irrigating at worst. If you ever wanted to recreate the sound of Nails on a Chalkboard on Spotify, then feel free to listen to the entire 7 minutes of Shoot Me Again. People rightfully so rip on Lars' snare drum or James' vocal performance, but not enough people talk about the awful guitar tone on this thing. And I'm by no means a tone snob. In fact, quote unquote bad guitar tone can work depending on the context, but St. Anger's guitar sounds so flubby and undefined. It almost sounds like they're using amp sims with no IRs. I expect better from this band, what were they doing? As for Risk, its worst crime is being incredibly boring and sounding like a shadow of the band who recorded even cryptic writings. So with that, and the fact that it's quite a bit shorter so I don't need to suffer as long, I guess I'll give Megadeth the win here. But I stress, it is not an honorable win. There's not even one single track on either album I would classify as good. They both have one decent track though. Risk has the Doctor is Calling, which is kinda cool, and St. Hanker has the Unnamed Feeling, which is interesting, and hey, is that Edward Furlong? But they're just decent. And they're only decent when compared to the rest of the tracks on their respective albums. If either of these songs were on better records in either band's catalog, they wouldn't be worth taking a second look at. Now the heirs of both bands returning to their roots and going back to thrash like God intended. And this is where the album by album comparison just doesn't work anymore, because Metallica have released 3 records during this time, and Megadeth have released 7. So you might think based on that fact alone that Megadeth clears here as well. Yeah, not really, I have to give this one to Metallica, believe it or not. They've been relatively consistent. Sure, Death Magnetic is brick wall to hell and back. Sure, the second half of Hardwired is largely made up of forgettable filler. And sure, 72 seasons makes me kinda sad. But they're never on the level of something like Super Collider or The World Needs a Hero. Death Magnetic has some cool tracks. Broken Beat and Scarred, All Nightmare Long, and Cyanide are all really enjoyable if you ask me. The first side of Hardwired I still think is a good time. The title track is the most visceral Metallica's been since the 80s. Alice Rise has that signature Metallica sense of scale. Moth of Flame has a hell of an anthemic chorus with some tasty harmonized leads. And even though the second side is incredibly dull, it at least ends with the best Metallica song since fuck, maybe Blackened. I'm not lying guys, Spit at the Bone is that good. Metallica have written a lot of longer songs in the latter part of their career, but this is one of very few songs I can say that earns its track length. It has an intensity and atmosphere that reminds me of tracks like Disposable Heroes, Fight Fire With Fire, and Damaged Ink. It's songs like this that make me feel disappointed when I hear tracks off 72 seasons because I know that even this far into their career that Metallica can do much better than what they usually crank out. Speaking of 72 seasons, I still think it's quite mid overall. There's simply not much here worth getting attached to in my opinion. I like some tracks like Chasing Lights and Room of Mirrors a bit more than I did the first time I heard it, and this is the best James has sounded in years. He never sounded bad, but it sounds like his voice has a new lease on life in this record. I'll give it that. But the fact that Metallica's longest song ever that ends the album is so lackluster still leaves a really bad taste in my mouth. Though I'll say this, Lux Eterna I still think is great, barring that solo and it beats anything I heard from that last Megadeth record still. As for Dave Mustaine and the Megadeths, it's on the rough side, I can't lie here. I loathe The World Needs a Hero and Super Collider. The former I almost dislike more than Risk. At least Risk could be kind of entertaining at points, but this album is just boring forgettable thrash that has songwriting from Dave Mustaine who seems to have forgotten how to write interesting riffs and solos. What the hell happened here? Lest we forget some awful cuts like the worst attempt at a throwback I have ever heard with Return to Hanger and Moto Psycho which is up there with the worst of Risk. And Super Collider isn't the worst thing I guess, but the fact that they're still somehow capable of a misstep this big this late in the game when Risk happened almost a decade prior is mind boggling. Who wants to hear Megadeth record generic dad rock? And the rest of the albums are all pretty much the same. They're all acceptable, sure, but highly overrated. If you've heard one of these albums, you've heard them all. The reminiscence of what Overkill has been doing since the 90s. There's some good tracks though. Blackmail the Universe from The System Has Failed, Despite the Lyrics, the title track from United Abominations, This Day We Fight from Endgame, Sudden Death from 13, Poisonous Shadows from Dystopia, and Junkie from The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead. I think you can make a decent record or two out of all the songs on these albums. 
but listening to them all the way through is a tad painful, I'll be honest. They get so samey and tiring after a while. It's a real shame because Megadeth records used to be so much more varied with song structures that Dave would use. I remember the last time I listened to Endgame, I was pulling my hair out by the end. I was not having any fun. I can see they're not outright awful, and I can see why some people may appreciate the consistency of these albums. But to me, they're largely a tepid listening experience. The best of these records, in my opinion, is Dystopia, though that might be because I remember being really excited for that album to come out, and I really loved it at the time, even though it hasn't aged well at all. If you want a newer Megadeth album to listen to, I would recommend that one. It doesn't help that Dave's vocals over the years has somehow gotten worse, but I won't knock him too much because he went through some bad medical problems in the 2000s, mainly throat cancer, and it's Megadeth. His voice is still fine enough, it works. What doesn't work is the rapid decline in quality of Dave's riffs. Very few of them are memorable, and even worse, a lot of them sound the fucking same. and the political commentary has now become quite dreadful. Even though Dave's political songs used to be among the band's best, you could tell he had a pretty good idea of what he was talking about, but now he has the political understanding of your drunk uncle yelling at CNN. It's never anything substantial. It's all Pirates of the People, the big bad elite are being big and bad, and Obama is the Antichrist. Also, gays don't deserve rights, apparently. And I could almost forgive it if there were at least well-written lyrics. But Dave... What are you doing here, dude? In the 2000s, Dave became a born-again Christian, and ever since, his lyrics really took a hit. And I usually don't care about an artist's religion because it's usually not very relevant, and when it is relevant, sometimes the lyrics that come from a religious perspective can be quite insightful. But Dave not only will not shut up about his religion, but he's now also the exact opposite of insightful. He was never Bob Dylan, he was never subtle, even at the best of times. But current Megadeth lyrics like America Stan makes Holy Wars look like Holy Scripture. The moment I lost faith in Dave Mustaine ever writing good lyrics again is when I found out that he named the 2009 album Endgame after the Alex Jones film of the same name. At that very moment, I knew it was fucking over. I may have only found out relatively recently, but it doesn't make it sting any less. Yeah, so that was an unfortunate note to end that portion of the video on. I apologize. But... Whom do I prefer overall? Surprisingly enough, even though I have wailed on Mr. Mustard Stain throughout this whole video, I do prefer Megadeth through everything. I've never met Dave, but from what I've gathered, I don't really like him as a person. I believe he helps spread very harmful ideas with his lyrics and statements in the press. If you think I'm being too harsh, keep in mind, as a member of the LGBTQ community, how are statements like this supposed to make me feel as a fan? Stick that finger right up your ass, you little faggot. His latter output is also really underwhelming all around, even barring his awful lyrics. And stop it all off, he's still so jealous of Metallica. He's such a bitter prick. It's not even deniable anymore. It's clearer today than it ever has been. I don't care how much of a Dave simp you are. Even his former bandmates are calling him out on this. Granted, Ellison is not really one to talk, but still, he makes a good point. I'm sure with every outrageous statement Mustaine makes about politics, Metallica, or life in general, Lars and James become more and more vindicated of their decision to kick him to the curb on that fateful day in 1983. I'm aware I'm not making any friends here. I'm gonna get the Metallica fanboys pissed off that I picked Megadeth over them, and I'm gonna get the Megadeth fanboys pissed because I called Dave Mustaine out on a lot of his bullshit. Sorry, facts don't care about your feelings. But hopefully, if nothing else, this should prove that I'm not too biased. And even if you're a major Dave Nutswinger, you should still be happy that he was ousted from Metallica. Because of that decision Lars, Cliff, and James made, we now have two kick-ass legendary metal bands instead of one. Hey guys, thanks for making it all the way to the end. Tell me what band you prefer in the comments and why. Just don't be a dick about it and try to be civil. That's all I ask. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share so my listening to Megadeth's last album wasn't for nothing. But anyways, take it easy, party people.